Today I'll be talking about Chopin's Nocturne in E minor. Um, this is like a little tutorial, I'll give you some practice tips, um, some ways you can learn this and work on it. So uh, this was written in 1827, I think he was about 17 years old, and it was actually published posthumously, so it was never actually published during his life. He apparently didn't really like this piece that much, so uh, I think it's one of the most beautiful nocturnes and one of the most famous. So. Uh, yeah. So the first thing I'll suggest, uh, we are in E minor, so I'd recommend warming up with the E minor scales, maybe harmonic, because you have the D sharp a lot. In this piece, maybe right hand, left hand, and so on. We also spend a bit of time in G major, so we practice those scales, uh, maybe some triads, some chords in these keys. We also spend a bit of time, uh, especially in the middle section, in B major. So that involves all five sharps, all five black keys on the piano. So I spend a bit of time warming up with chords as we work through some of the uh, little sections and exercises through this. I'll give you more ideas, uh, things that you could actually use as a warm up as you work through this. So uh, we are in E minor, and uh, one of the things you might notice, we are in 4-4, four, four. we're in cut time here. But uh, the left hand spends most of its time doing triplets. So it's more of a 12-8 feel in the left hand. So we have one, two, three, four. One, two, triplet, triplet. So you really want to feel those triplets. So with a bit of emphasis, not, uh, not on the other beats, just on the first beat. right hand is more of a 4-4 four, four feel, so uh, mostly in quarter notes, some eighth notes, the right hand does have top triplets definitely in some sections, but it's definitely more of a 4-4 four, four over a 12-8 feel, so you want to bring that out, that really adds, I think, to the tension and uh, the expression of the piece. So for this exercise, I'm going to teach you a little bit about the left hand and some ways you can practice that. So I'm just going to bring the camera over here so you can have a look at that. So left hand works here in E minor. Now you'll notice this is a 10th. I go E, B, G. I use my second finger as a pivot. So I sort of hold that one and use that to shift the 10th. Of course, some of you might be able to reach a 10th easily. I can't, I can only reach about an eighth or a ninth. Okay, so that's that first shape. So I'd recommend just practicing this back and forth between them to sort of get this action. You want sort of an arcing action in the hand. It's hard to sort of show that. But there's this up and over motion. There's lots of pedal stuff going on. We'll talk about that once we get the pattern going. So there's this shape. And then we have this shape, which is just a sixth. Okay, so we have those. You can even go back and forth between practicing this as a unit and then holding this as like a little chord. Those are your two shapes there and that uh, that figure repeats a lot throughout the whole piece um, a lot definitely in E minor and similar pattern in uh, B major and versions of B major so that's our first section you want to not bring out the C B too loudly you still want to hear it but you don't want it to sort of bump when you get there, so that's something to really watch out for. Um, it depends on your piano too. I find my piano is quite uh, bright in the middle octave, so it's really hard to uh, hold back there. So we worked on yeah, pivoting, so holding this one, working your tenths, and then you can also do solid groups. Now we get to do some different figures, so similar we have uh, F sharp, B, just a different uh, organization because there is an F sharp in there, so it's going to look a little different. This time I'm going to use three on the B, so I pivot with three, I play five on the F sharp, and then thumb on the A. 
pulls that shape, okay? I find this one a little bit easier, I think, because of the distance. Uh, this tent is a little shorter because the sharp brings us a little closer together. So we practice that. These are just awesome exercises as well. And then uh, a little bit different up here. So we have this shape this time. So we have this guy and then this guy. And normally on the page, they give you suggestions of finger numbers. I find in this edition, uh, they're quite good. But of course, if you don't like them, um, if you have smaller hands or if you have larger hands or something's just uncomfortable, change it to something that feels better for you. Uh, just ensure that you're always doing the same thing so it's nice and consistent. So the next one is G, B, G. So that was just an octave. That one's kind of nice because I just stay there. Generally in shapes like this, I use finger four instead of finger three, and that's just a good habit to get into. It strengthens your hand, especially fingers four and five, when you make sure you use four whenever you can. So we have that shape. I would just practice that one solid, and then we go back to this one. through every single bar but I'll show you a few of these main ones this next one is D sharp B A so we have a really big jump there it's up to you you can use I would use obviously use pinky at the bottom either two or three whatever accommodates you getting to the high A better kind of like three there I think so I keep three again and you would practice this this is a bigger jump Again, you want this sort of arcing action. And then you can practice. You could even go back and up and down. Sort of, sort of want to grease the wheels in those patterns. So there's that one. And then a lot of our top patterns are the same. Ah, and then we go back to the first pattern. So you'll find as you practice this with lots of repetition, a lot of the patterns will become easier because your hands will get used to these shapes and to these patterns and the muscle memory will really build there. Let's look at the next one. So we have some octaves here and they suggest that would be five and then one. That's, if they don't write anything, it would just be um, sort of the most basic or the most well-known fingering. So be five, one, and then we're gonna cross two over. So I like to practice that by holding the octave and then reaching two up. Go octave two. So it's almost like you use your thumb as a pivot this time and you cross as much as you can. And I actually, I'm gonna use the word throw, but I pass or throw my second finger the rest of the way. So there's that one. So that's a kind of a different, uh, different action than the other one. And you're kind of like, well, why is it two there? It's kind of interesting. So we do the Bs, the uh, three octaves of Bs. And then right there, I don't have it written in, but two be on the B, three would be on the A sharp, and then your thumb will sneak under. So we sort of have a cross over and a cross under, and this is where things get a little more complicated. This would be probably be a measure you would have to go over um, a little more in isolation. So there's that crossover. Now three is gonna be on the A sharp, one on the G, and then they suggest four on this A sharp. So you have this first move, three cross under and then more octaves and then a pretty straightforward uh, B triad so three fingers so just watch out all these different patterns you can practice a lot of them in a similar way uh, let's just have a look through so these should all be similar I mean we're different chords different triads um, similar similar this one again is has another little octave crossy thing so watch just watch where the thumb goes that usually can guide you quite well. Um, some of them have a few more steps and these ones you'll just find your way down the octaves. Um, just a note about the octaves, so that measure. Because when we're playing it all hands together, but when you put it together, make sure you're not sort of slamming on the octaves. It's really tempting. Um, sometimes there is a crescendo. Uh, this is a nocturne though. So just try to hold back a little bit. You can build up, just make sure, uh, again, nothing sort of bumps or sticks out. So that's basically the left hand, uh, the concept of that for the entire piece. We're going to be major here in the middle section of the piece. So similar pattern, this time it's an octave with a crossover. Uh, pardon me, it's a fifth and then an octave. 
So I like to sort of pass my thumb up. So here I go, five, two, one. Sometimes you just have to jump. We'll talk about how the pedal comes into that in just a minute. Um, sometimes you can kind of cheat, cheat your way up using a bit of pedal. You just kind of have to in some of them because there's really long jumps. So again, more thumb cross under, cross under. This is our, this is our first section again. Uh, we have different right hand melody there. We'll talk about after as well. So I think that's about it for uh, the left hand patterns. And then in the final section, we go, uh, eventually we make our way into E major. So the patterns are really similar, but we are in E major land. So again, the most important things about the left hand uh, really have this six, eight feel and uh, make sure nothing really bumps. So you want this nice expression without anything sticking out too much, maybe a little tiny bit more in the bass, we don't, but we don't want, we don't want anything to all of a sudden have a sort of a slamming, a slamming sound. So we'll talk a little bit about pedal. You can see on the page there are pedal markings, so pedal down. That's pedal clear, and when you clear the pedal, um, a lot of you probably know it's just click up, down, up, down. So wherever it shows that star here, that's where you release the pedal, and then I usually just put it down um, right away or in time to catch sort of the next note. So it's sort of somewhere kind of here-ish. The book just sort of puts it uh, generally in this spot. So depending on what your right hand is doing, that might change a little bit. So for this first bar, because we're all on one uh, harmony, we're all in E minor, you're gonna have one pedal this whole time and uh, then change it. Now, when the right hand starts to come in and when the left hand starts to have one more, uh, more than one harmonic idea per bar, you'll be changing the pedal more often. So since some of these bars, you're changing it three or four, even sometimes up to five times, maybe. I don't know if it's quite written there. But uh, yeah, by the end of the piece, they sort of expect you to know, so they write fewer of them in. So uh, yeah, so for the first part, I'll just kind of, I'll play it and I'll kind of show you here. So I would do all of that on one, that's what's written, and then for the next bar, I just change. And you want a really quick flick, keep the heel down, just lift the toe. And then here we have two in, in a bar, sorry, right now. So I do more often change, 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 change. And then the other thing would be a bit of flutter pedal. So in sections like this, I just think whenever I see more notes, especially uh, something like this with the right hand descending, um, there's some bits definitely in here where we want to keep the right hand really clear. And we'll talk about this right hand part after. Um, we want to keep clarity here. We still want to maintain the harmony. So you do something called a flutter pedal. And I really just kind of cheat it. I just wiggle my foot on the pedal and uh, you'll hear that when we put it all together so you'll do the main pedal changes uh wherever they were and again they don't really write them in here you're just expected to know to sort of do a flutter pedal or a half pedal so it's where you lift it up just a little bit um i don't quite know what else to compare that to it's sort of like you take just a little bit of a breath but not a full breath so that's the main idea behind the left hand um let's take a little look at the right hand. So the right hand is more of a 4-4 four, four feel, right? So we have one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, and three, and four, and one, two, three, four. That's on maybe a little fast, but that's sort of the feeling of the right hand as opposed to the left hand where we have the that feeling. Uh, so some things with the right hand, um, you know, if you're at the level where you can learn this piece as well, pieces I recommend just sort of sight reading it through a few times, maybe listening to it. So you have it just in your ear a little bit. Uh, make sure you are reading the timing and uh, doing your best to give things their full value. Uh, watch little things like the dots where there are 
um, quarter notes where there are two voices. So somewhere like this, you would hold that note. So you'd have this and then you'd have, so this one's still holding while you play two Ds. He does a lot of these appoggiaturas, these uh, tension and resolution. They're really beautiful. And the main thing with the right hand, this is really your voice. You want it to just be so beautiful. Again, no bumps, especially in the big sections with the octaves, you're going to sometimes want to give more and you can, but make sure it's really uh, in an even way. So maybe I'll just uh, play a little bit of that section for you. Pop this back here. So, the right hand, so let's pretend you already know the left hand. voice of the right hand so make sure you don't have really heavy especially in the lower notes that those are nice and brought out on the top um, the next bit's a little bit tricky because we have two voices so you want to hear combination of the two again I would say a little bit more of the top true melody sorry my piano's a bit out of tune but uh we'll get the ideas of this one um the other main thing with the right hand to ensure it's not uh feeling bumpy is that you're playing really legato so if you have something like this these thirds you want to use the legato fingering so that they suggest there five three two four one three and then one two and then four two suggested fingering um, if you don't know maybe you have a teacher um, who can show you the legato fingering you always want the path of uh, I don't say least resistance but the uh, closest possible fingering so you're really joining the sound and that makes the pedaling a little bit easier because then your fingers are doing the work they're holding the sound and uh, you don't need to rely on the foot to maintain the tone and it's also just, just better technique. If for some reason your foot slipped, um, then there would be no sound. Uh, another thing is you can hear the difference between someone who's sort of playing. Okay, I have the pedal down, they're going. Right? It, it sounds a bit bumpier. You can tell I'm just going whatever. And then between going like this. So that's the legato fingering. And then all I have to do is add a little bit of pedal even too much pedal but it also depends on what the left hand is doing and then what you're also going for in terms of expression in that part so that's kind of the idea of the right hand um, in a minute we'll talk about some of the uh, irregular groupings and then some of the ornaments the trickiest thing in this piece as with a lot of pieces is you'll notice the left hand starting even in this fourth measure here uh, oh even in the second measure actually we have one so there the left hand has a triplet, so three beats, sorry, three notes in one beat, and the right hand has uh, two eighth notes, so it's two notes in one beat. So the best way to learn this, I think, is to do a ton of hand separate practice. So especially the left hand starts to feel automatic, and then you can put your focus on really expressing the right hand and getting that in time. So for example, that measure, uh, I'll just put the camera back here again. So the left hand's gonna be working in doing a triplet, the right hand is going to be doing two eighths. Okay, so it's 
uh, two against three. I'll start uh, give a give a beat. Okay, so you want triple So don't worry about matching up the second eighth note and the triplets like some people are like oh I gotta fit this in here and you can sort of mash it together that way a few times but then it's going to start to sound like something is dotted and it sounds a little bit um a little bit off so you want to just do your best to just be able to hear them separately and that's that's one of the reasons piano is pretty difficult is you have to be able to do um, different rhythms at the same time with your different hands and obviously getting the notes and the fingering correct and the expression and the pedal so that's even that that uh, beat is really challenging and then here you have a bunch in a row sometimes it's easier when you have a few because you can sort of feel the flow of that so i'll show you that and then uh, i'll also show you this one too if you've ever played moonlight sonata this is the same kind of rhythm where the right hand goes um anyone remembers that <laughs> So one voice is doing triplets, another voice has an eighth, a uh, dotted eighth with a sixteenth. So this fits kind of after this one, but don't try to like math it out. It's just, this is a different rhythm than this and they're happening at the same time. I think that's the better way to think of it um, rather than dividing things and drawing lines and all of this. Um, you can find the general shape, but you want to know what those are on their own. So I'll just play um, play you a bit of that just so you can get more of a feeling against three three against two. I'm not always perfect on all of them. But again we just we just try um, try our best and try to keep the left hand automatic and then have a little more of the right hand. I'm just gonna go for measure two where the right hand comes in. about the rubato after that adds another definitely an element of difficulty especially when you are um, getting all this timing together so that's a uh, really big thing to think about I really recommend doing tons and tons and tons of hand separate practice so you can do that expressively you can do it easily without sort of having to worry about one hand or the other so that comes back pretty much throughout the entire piece so uh, let's have a look at the trills and some of the irregular groupings in the right hand. I can show you how to practice some of those. I just do the trills in this piece sort of as um, like a mordant where it just kind of goes up and down. So on page two. So it, for the A, it's not really a trill trill. I've heard some people do it the other way. Um, you might need to look up exactly what they are. Um, sometimes there's a bit of a, a dispute over which trills do what by which composer. But uh, if you're just playing this for fun and you're getting everything else in time and a certain trill sounds good to you, uh, you might have fun just doing that. So the most important thing is that the main beats are in time. So I just turn this A into my trill and then I make sure the G's are in time. And then of course getting these lower voices in time as well. So it's just a little ornament that fits in there. Um, same on these ones. So here we're back to the A section. So I would practice this one. This one is four uh, four sixteenth notes against three eighth notes against the triplet. So same idea as two against three, four against three. You would practice this separately. So I would practice. I would even just leave out any of the trills or oops, sorry, any of the trills or grace notes right now. So I go one, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Yeah. And work on just these ornaments. I would maybe do these two bars in a row. And then once you feel confident, you'll turn this B into the trill. So you'll, you'll do your one, two, 
three, four, one, two, three. Yeah, sorry, I gotta get that one a little bit quicker. But... And don't beat yourself up uh, when you're just practicing. If it's a little bit out of time, you in general obviously want things to be uh, be at the tempo you're practicing at. But if you find um, you need to slow down on something like this or something like this, just, just make a mental note of it and know that you need to get it all in tempo. Um, the cool thing with Chopin is we'll talk about the rubato and sometimes you can change the tempo a little bit, although you don't want it to sound like you're going slow just because something is difficult. Um, so this one, this is a sextuplet against a triplet. So this one's a little bit easier to count because you know it's just two for every one of the left hand notes. So that's actually a little bit easier. So you have the left hand doing, uh, uh, it's a different version of our first pattern, but uh, it's still the same, same rhythm. So we have this one this time. So we have triplet, trip, triplet, so triplet, triplet. Triplet, ta, right? Triplet, And you just add in. Likewise with this one, you have six in the time of the three eighth notes. So it'll just be two for every one of those. Um, try to get the little trill quick and out of the way. So like a... okay, and that one's extra tricky because it's linked up with this F sharp. So I just practice it without the grace note first and even without the trill first. So you're practicing going. Uh, and you wanna make sure your finger four ends up on the F sharp. So we have one, two, three, one, four, five. And that also accommodates when you do do the grace note. And you're gonna have to stretch uh, one to four there. That's a big one. And then that is going to link up with this, I guess we call this an octuplet. There's eight and a beat. So when you have any that, I, in this in this uh, time signature, I would say anything bigger than six. Um, so when you have a seven or an eight, or we're gonna get a 10 and an 11 in a minute here. Um, I would split these up into groups of two and three. Maybe think you could think, maybe think of one as a group of four. So it's generally, um, whatever you think sounds best. So, uh, I'm not sure what I normally do for this one. I mean, the first thing would be to practice the group. So it's just a diminished chord. So you have this shape. And then watching this one, you don't, you don't have that other note. You just have three notes. And then you're opening up into your sixth. Uh, so just think about kind of how that feels in the hand first. And then we have those first eight notes that need to fit in the time of the triplet. So the left hand in that bar will be. Just sort of get that sense of those triplets. Triplet, triplet, triplet. So sort of aim for more of a six there. So, yeah. Um, another trick you can do is play the first note of that beat and then the landing note of the next beat. So for example, I play this with this and then just play that. So I just press like me, 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 me. And we'll demo that one for you. So uh, we've just come off the sextuplet. Again, a lot of the notes within the, the tuplet will not line up with the left hand, right? The first one will start with in time, um, but likely the, the other two uh, left hand triplets won't match up directly with the right hand. of the irregular grouping. The ones coming up will definitely have sort of an element of that. Um, this one I think might be a little more laid back. So I sort of do um, maybe three, three and two. So triple it, triple it, two, two. It sort of lands, you can, you can decide. I mean, it's up, definitely up for interpretation. 
I don't know what that's called, a centuplet, something like that. Uh, so there's that guy. Leave the trail out for now, that's just an extra twiddle. Um, so this one, just because it is a crescendo and it's um, ascending and we're you know building to this big thing. So I sort of think of, um, place one a little bit how it's written, so try and fit in the 4.30 seconds in the time of the first eighth. And then, uh, Sort of maybe split evenly. So what is that? Four, three, and three makes ten. And really, when they're that fast, you're just going to do your best to fit them all in. Really important is that you are very, very sure of the fingering. So um, this edition is really awesome because it shows you where thumb and thumb go. So as long as you get those, um, you don't really have to think too much. Hopefully, about the rest. So we have. And again, at this speed, I'm not thinking so much about um, counting to 10, right? I just fit one, this gesture into this beat. So I might even practice going, which sounds really weird on its own. And then I might find sort of a midpoint, which might be the E. So I might do something like, it's a little bit dangerous because the E isn't at necessarily a specific uh, beat like the triplets are. So I just want to sort of feel the shape of it, but not necessarily time the E too much. So, And the pedal really helps with these. Um, it's a little bit cheaty, but the pedal releases the dampers. Maybe I'll see, there you go. Releases the dampers there. So when you're playing some of these pitches, you won't be able to see those ones, but um, makes it just a little bit easier to um, achieve some sound, so you don't necessarily have to play quite as loud. So yeah, I think um, the main thing is just to play around with it, get really comfortable with the fingering and the pattern, and then you'll just be able to go. And again, um, this is probably the most important point about the whole piece, is that you need to have the left hand pretty much automatic, so you don't have to think about it so much, because the right hand does have all these difficult passages. Um, and then we'll skip the trills for a minute. And we'll look at this one. This is 11 notes fit into a beat. And you'll see I have some fingering written in there. Uh, so we have a group of four. This isn't necessarily the rhythm, but just the fingering. So I have a group of four, and I like to practice these as groups. So I have a group of four, group of three, and then I actually do a group of five. Then it actually opens up into the octave. One, two, three, four, five. And that's probably the action. I practice most when I practice this practice this piece. So you can even practice going thumb because that's tricky to go from such a compact hand position to a really wide octave. Okay. So um, just in terms of fingering, so we have four, three, and then it's a five. You can think of it as a four and then an octave. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. And then I just do that like probably about 10, 20 times, which I have everybody around me nuts. Um, just getting getting that pattern. So one, two, three, four, one, two, three, one, two, three, four, five. And you can practice each one. Again, a little bit of pedal. Maybe a little bit cheaty, but it just helps facilitate those notes to play and then you can try joining two groups together so the um, first group of four and then the next group of three one two three four one two three so I just worry about my thumbs right that's the placement of the thumbs it's actually just a just a little C triad and then I might practice something like this and then aim down to the B because that's actually where my thumb is going this was tricky when you're holding a camera. And the one where you find you might get stuck is this finger four. So maybe just spend some extra time doing the finger four. And 
And as best you can, you wanna really play down into the key. You don't just wanna sort of be um, floating above, especially this one, there's a huge crescendo for it with dynamic marking. Uh, oh, we were at a piano, sort of. I mean, I play this part fairly strongly, so like maybe a forte. Uh, well, we're becoming forte on the next page, so can we definitely be leaning toward mezzo forte forte by the time you get there. Um, left hand also has these really cool, these F sharp octaves, which will really help just build the sound there. And that's a spot where you do want to avoid uh, the bumps. So let's just talk about um, the trills and the uh, little grace notes in this section. And uh, these trills, I usually just start as a traditional trill on the uh, upper note. So we've come from. Sorry, just do that. Um, someone might say maybe the Chopin ones, you have to start on the note. Um, I've sort of heard it both ways, so. Now this one's really challenging because you have the trill note. So here the B is trilling. At the end of the trill again, I time this. It looks like it's about lined up with this E sharp, so that one I do line up with the uh, triplet, the last triplet of the uh, bar when it gets there. And then here, uh, so here we're trilling uh, C sharp B, so there's a trill on B. And then this one, the trill moves to C sharp, but you'll notice the B is tied. So we're actually just tying the B, then trill a tone higher, and then we still keep trilling on the C sharp and we add the A sharp. So um, something like this, I might lose a little bit of the timing, but uh, so I'm trilling here. Get these fingers, and then I'm gonna do the grace note, keep the B trill here, and then change your bottom one. So you just keep the C sharp trill, but you change your bottom note. So it's a second voice, and then that leads into that really tricky chromatic. That's another good point. Uh, if you're warming up for this piece in any Chopin, really, I would do a bunch of chromatics and maybe even isolate this little uh, figure as its own individual warm up. Like, I, you can probably do that a billion, billion times, and it's still, uh, still a, pr a pretty challenging one. Uh, one other note about the little grace notes. Um, generally, I find in these editions, the grace notes that come right before the bar line, they are indeed right before the bar line. And then um, these ones, he usually is written as like a, uh, I don't know if it exactly be called a pagiatura, but it would be more like a true eighth note. So a little bit of a slower grace note. Um, I tend to kind of fudge them a little bit. They're like that, um, something like this, it would match up to that one. Um, same with this guy, so you have, I tend to fit that one, yeah, but right about when the, where that one ends, where this figure, the second beat begins, so we have, um, so just kind of, you just kind of fit that one in there. Just make sure they're always nice and clear, that they aren't just getting mushy. Sometimes you'll hear something like that. So you find they are getting mushy, a little bit of staccato work and I recommend doing uh, maybe the um, substitution fingering on a repeated note it just keeps it kind of expressive and not too heavy uh, and then we get into the last page which uh, is I think a little bit easier than the other sections if we work into the E major I think the main thing in this bit is to watch the dynamics well throughout the whole piece and uh, don't let the left hand get lazy or even the piece lose its intensity. We have the big sort of climax in the top of this page and then we come right down into E major. Uh, so don't lose, uh, don't lose that. So the last thing um, with this and with any piece is to uh, polish. So once you've learned the notes, you've learned the timing, you've learned the fingering, you have a pretty good handle on the pedal you want to work with, um, you know, the final elements that makes it, say, performance ready. And uh, this is just a little tutorial. I'm not expecting to be perfect at this today. I'm just giving you some um, ideas for practice techniques. So uh, the first thing that you should hopefully already be doing when you're practicing is the dynamics. Um, 
And some of them, you know, they aren't necessarily absolute, but it's more the the uh, the feeling, the intention in that part. So it's like, why is this meant so for? Say, why do I get louder here? Why do I get softer? Let me even help you with some of the rhythms because um, it sort of shows you where to go. So it sort of makes more, more sense of the whole thing. Um, another thing is the rubato. So I'll, I'll give you a little demo of what rubato is. Rubato is uh, pushing and pulling of the tempo, but uh, still staying overall in the same timing. So if this piece takes four minutes to play, I may speed up in some parts, or like little waves, I may speed up in some parts, slow down in other parts, hopefully um, sort of in a very equal manner, and I'll still be done the piece in four minutes. So it doesn't actually change the overall um, time of the piece. It's not all of a sudden really slow. It's just gentle pushing and pulling of the tempo within the piece. Um, some people play this piece quite fast. Some people play it quite slow. Um, I'll probably try it somewhere in the middle to uh, give an idea. And you can, you know, you can always play around with the rubato too. So just an example of that. And you can do it right at the beginning. So this is very straight. Triplets. And you might hear some versions we kind of speed up. And then choose some notes to pull back Exaggerating it, that's the best way to learn it. You just play it and then maybe record yourself or listen and say, hey, maybe that might have been too much, or hey, I could do more here. So that's an idea. Um, the other thing is to uh, work on the pedal. Just, just really, truly listen to yourself that you aren't pedaling too much and that you, uh, sorry, you aren't using too much pedal and that you are. Uh, changing the pedal appropriately. Um, I tend to work too much pedal, so avoid that. Um, sometimes we can use it to hide our mistakes. So um, I think I'll just play through for you, and then I might stop and start and just uh, point out any last little things I might have uh, forgotten in the talk through. So we start piano, molto legato, so we're very, very smooth. Again, try to do a lot of that with your fingers, keeping them close to the keys keeping the sound connected and the pedal's just there to add effect. The pedal shouldn't be doing too much of the work unless you have a really big jump and you don't have a choice.
So a lot of stuff to think about in that piece um, is the timing, the, especially because the two hands have different uh, different rhythms a lot. Uh, the left hand is relentless. It does not give up those triplets uh, until the very last chord. So the left hand is very, very stable on that the whole time. So that would probably be the first task is to learn that. Uh, really work on keeping the right hand beautiful, melodic. And I just say really enjoy it. Um, just, I got a little bit nervous in the in the uh, page three with all the uh, irregular groupings and I missed a few notes there. But, um, you know, I think just enjoy it and don't be afraid of it. You know, likely as you're practicing, you're going to miss some of these. But it's really getting the whole shape. And if you're confident in where that shape is going, eventually the notes, they'll, they'll come in with practice and repetition. Um, slow practice is also really, really good on those. And uh, yeah, I was putting in the dynamics, um, bringing out the top of the melody. And I think the most important thing is to really listen that you're not using too much pedal, that the balance is really good. You can play with the rubato, maybe try it really fast one day or try it really quite slow and play around and get ideas from that. I just did, again, a pretty neutral um, interpretation. I don't practice this every day either. So um, just sort of a little basic idea. I've heard it really fast and really slow as well. Thank you so much for watching and I hope this has given you some ideas and is helpful for you. If you have any questions or maybe suggestions for another piece, this is my first one of these. So if you have any suggestions for another piece or something you're wondering about, you can put it down in the comments. And if you haven't, uh, just click the subscribe button there and you'll get updates for new videos. Um, I do a lot of just playing videos, but I'm hoping to do more of these, uh, more like tutorials and uh, videos that can teach you something. So thanks again for watching and have fun learning this piece.